we're part of nature, and as we destroy nature, we destroy ourselves. It's a selfish thing to want to protect nature. The first commitment to the environment that uh, Yvonne made was back in the very early 1970s when he still made mountain climbing equipment. That when you hammer those into the rock, then you take them out, it harms the rock. If a climb on a mountain is very popular with many people, then those pitons going in and out hundreds, even thousands of times, make increasingly big holes mm -hmm. in the crack. Mm -hmm. It's permanent damage mm -hmm. to the rock. Mm -hmm. And Yvonne saw this. Mm -hmm. Many of us saw this. Mm -hmm. But no one had a solution until Yvonne helped develop a new type aluminum wedge. I was a little French and Indian kid, born in Maine, moved to California when I was seven years old, couldn't speak. English. I lived near Griffith Park in Burbank, and um, I'd spent all my time there. I made myself a bow and arrow, and hunting rabbits, and catching crawdads and frogs, and uh, always with a view to eating off the off the land. And from there, I went into a love of falconry, training hawks and falcons. That led to climbing to hawks' nests, and then that led to mountain climbing. So I had quite a career in climbing all over the world and every continent. I had to figure out something to do to make some money, so I, I became a blacksmith with a view towards uh, making climbing equipment. When I was climbing, I'd look at all the climbing equipment and I thought, you know, this is pretty crude. I can make a better version of it. I get all my good ideas out, outside. Because every time you go out, you come back with a new idea on how to improve the gear or a different technique or doing something. When I was making all the climbing gear, it was a labor of love. I wasn't making hardly any money at it. But I was uh, climbing one year in, uh, in the winter in Scotland. And coming back to Edinburgh, I saw a rugby shirt in a, in a sports shop. And I thought, let's make a great uh, shirt for climbing. It was real rugged, had rubber buttons. Everything was reinforced so that it wouldn't rip. But I started wearing this climbing and everybody came up to me and said, wow, that's a great looking shirt. And I thought, wow, everybody's pretty excited about this. Maybe I ought to import a few, see if I can sell some. And I did and they sold like crazy, of course. And that led to you know, making a few more pieces of clothing for climbing. All with the idea of starting with the principles of industrial design rather than fashion design. You know, fashion design, you start with a mannequin, you wrap some cloth around it, you pin it here and there, you come up with this creation. Industrial design, you come up with a functional need that you have to solve. And so that's the way we've always approached making clothing. So that's been the secret of our success, really, I think. I was running the company just like a normal company without thinking about the environmental ramifications of what we were doing. And um, one time we opened a store in Boston, and within three days, the, com the Employees were complaining that they were getting headaches. So I closed the place down, brought in a chemical engineer, and he said, oh, says, you're poisoning your employees. I said, what? He said, yeah, they've got formaldehyde poisoning. Because your ventilation system is recycling the same air. It's not working properly. So any other company would have said, fix the ventilation system. Don't tell me about where the poison's coming from. So I said, well, what's the poison? He said, well, it's formaldehyde, which is put on all cotton clothes to make it stay pressed, to minimize the shrinkage and uh, wrinkling. I said, well, geez, I don't want to make clothing with this poison on them. That's when I started thinking about 
maybe we better think about what what we're doing here. We're just blindly going on making clothing without knowing what we're doing. So what other chemicals and stuff are used to make clothing that's really toxic? That's when we started asking questions. Over the years, we've asked enough questions so that we've pretty much cleaned up our whole supply chain. It's more expensive to do that, but as it turns out, our customers really appreciate that. They appreciate the fact that we're doing all the work for them and sorting out what is the least harmful way to dress. So it's, it's another reason for our success. My livelihood is based on people going into the outdoors. I feel like I have more responsibility than the average person in protecting those outdoors. And so we take 1% of our sales, which means that even if we have a non-profitable year, we still have to give the money away. I don't look at it as philanthropy. It's a cost of doing business, period. It's a cost of using up non-renewable resources. It's a cost for living on this planet. I'm not in business to grow a larger business. I'm not in business to get richer or to be a big shot or anything. I'm very pessimistic about the fate of the planet. And I use business to try to influence other companies and to being more responsible. When we switched over to organically grown cotton, that was 20% of our business at risk because no one else was doing organic cotton. People had tried it, dabbled in it a little bit, and failed. And so it was up to us to absolutely prove that it was the right way to go. In my own life, I'm trying to simplify my life as much as I can. And I've learned that in sport, that when you, when you become a really great climber, you don't need a rope. <laughs> you don't need any Gore-Tex. You don't need anything. You just solo. In fact, you can solo barefooted, probably. You know, I think it was Thoreau may, maybe said that the more you know, the less you need. And I've learned doing these sports um, that as you become more proficient at them, you use less and less stuff. I'm Behind so me are 55 people extending the life of our product for our customers. Doug Freeman is Patagonia's chief operating officer. We want our customers to invest in great product, and when it's worn out, we want to repair it for them. It doesn't sound economical for the company. I can understand why you'd say that, but the way we view it is that we want to reduce consumption. That's what makes Patagonia so odd, a supposedly anti-consumption corporation. Since its founding in 1973, it's always had a so-called ironclad guarantee, including free repairs, but recently the company ramped up its promotion of that pledge with a cross-country worn wear bus tour, biodiesel fueled of course, tailors reviving garments at stops along the way. And though it spends little on advertising, Patagonia donates more than twice as much to environmental causes as in a famous full-page New York Times ad, don't buy this jacket. It, it seems uh, oxymoronic. It certainly does. In fact, sales are booming, up 25 to 30 percent a year since that ad ran. But we wanted to know, is this just a sales gimmick? So we went to the new Patagonia store in New York City's Soho district, which boasts its own repair center, and in keeping with the reduce, reuse, recycle ethos, features wood beams salvaged from the former Domino Sugar factory and marble counters reclaimed from the renovation of the Museum of Modern Art. According to Patagonia, if you buy stuff that lasts and gets revived so it will last even longer, well, in the long run, less stuff will get made and consumed. We hope our existing customers do indeed buy less, but we hope to attract more customers that are interested in our message to build the best product to reduce our impact and cause the least amount of environmental harm. The way you could really reduce the company's footprint is by not selling any product at all. Sure, but if we can show you know, the business community that we're successful, 
we think we're holding ourselves as a great example for how business can be done differently. A lot of people tend to over-design things, especially for climbing and outdoor use, and it's really pretty basic. You don't need a lot. I think that's been kind of the ethos of Patagonia is it's not what you add, it's what you can take away, you know? Yvonne essentially brought color to the outdoor industry. We bring in playfulness. After spending multiple times holed up for weeks at a time in a tent, realized that he wanted some joy in there. And also all those colors we see in nature, the, the lichens and wildflowers and sky tones and sea tones and the clothes are about play and about personal expression. That's why my book is called Let My People Go Surfing. Because mm -hmm. if the surf comes up here, mm -hmm. everybody leaves and goes surfing. So I don't care when people work, mm -hmm. as long as the uh, work gets done. Mm -hmm. And so there's no one standing over people saying do this, do that. Mm -hmm. We make sure that the children that come out of there are the best product of the company. It's not a babysitting mm -hmm. service. Children get very, very high quality mm -hmm. education. First and foremost, like, and if you look at like the, the Patagonia mission statement, it's like first is build the best product, and second is cause no unnecessary environmental harm. So I think that still, first and foremost, it needs to be the best product. So definitely both are really, really important. Um, but I think that for each of those environmental solutions to a product, we have to make sure that it performs equally or better than the kind of the standard. Uh, Yvonne and, um, and Melinda, they personally care a lot about the environment. Mm -hmm. um, all the employees at Patagonia care a lot about the environment. That's one of the main goals as well, is just to, to show that it doesn't, it doesn't need to all be about like, you know, watershed groups working on a project. The mm -hmm. business should be involved and should be helping fund those projects. And mm -hmm. that. I think most of those companies, and in fact, I don't know if any of our big competitors who give 1% of their sales to grassroots environmental organizations. Um, the cumulative amount of our cash giving is, you know, over $70 million over the life of the company. And if you go out this door right here and you look on the wall, it still says Friends of the Ventura River. That's the original sign that we put there in 1971. It's still there. That's why it's there. It's our memorial to this idea that we can support individuals and we can support uh, through, we can support nonprofit groups that represent society to empower them to protect their environment. Several years ago, uh, we ran an ad uh, in many magazines, mm -hmm. and uh, there were different versions of it, but the one that I remember the most had a, a picture of some dolphins swimming in the ocean, jumping out of the water, and the headline said, these are our shareholders. And I think that really represented the philosophy of our business. We're in the business to protect the planet. And those, those purposes are our shareholders. That's what we meant in that app. Yeah.